A very good morning to you. This is uh, Ian King Live. I'm uh, Wilfred Frost in for Ian today, bringing you an hour of business and economic news from the heart of the City of London. Snow, strikes, rising energy prices and economic gloom have had a dramatic effect on the UK economy. GDP data out this morning shows the UK economy recorded zero growth between October and December last year. The ONS uh, numbers are stark. Economic growth in the fourth quarter of last year, 0%, in line, though, with uh, economists' expectations. But the UK dodged a recession, thanks to gains at the start of the quarter. The Chancellor has been giving his reaction to our business correspondent, Paul Kelso. So is there any circumstance in which you would consider higher pay settlements for those public sector workers who are struggling with circumstances which your government and predecessors have helped create? Well, um, we have invested record sums in the NHS, in our schools, um, and we want to back them to the hilt because they have a very, very important job to do for the country. And we'll talk about absolutely anything to resolve these strikes, except measures that will entrench high inflation. And we don't think strikes are helpful, they're very damaging, they're very disruptive. We think the best way to resolve these issues is to sit and talk and find a solution that doesn't entrench the very inflation that is upsetting so many people. Plenty of economists will say that there's no danger of a wage price spiral from public sector wages. Are you saying there is no more money? Forget it. Get back to work. There's no chance of an increased payoff. Well, we should listen to the very clear warning from the Bank of England governor yesterday, who said that if you fund higher wage settlements through borrowing, that is inflationary. And that's why it's a very difficult situation uh, we want to get in, back into a situation where people's real wages are growing. But the one thing that we shouldn't do if we want that to happen is to do something that digs in this high inflation. So is that a no to more money? It's not a no. It's saying we'll talk about absolutely anything except things that will dig in the very high inflation that is causing people to see the, uh, the cost of their weekly shop go up and the value of their wages erode. As well as... Below inflation pay rises, if you're in the public sector, people are also facing, across the board, huge pressure on energy bills. You're about to put energy bills up by withdrawing support in April. Wholesale gas prices are falling. This is not as expensive as you would have initially thought. Is there any way you'll reconsider that withdrawal of support and give people help with energy bills through the spring? Well, we are doing absolutely everything we can to help families through this difficult period. We're giving about £3,500 of support on average to every family in the country this year and last year. So it's, it's a massive amount of help, about £99 billion. Um, but we also have to be responsible with public finances because if we're not, we just give them a different pressure, which is higher interest rates. So you won't reconsider that? Well, we look at everything we can do, but we won't do things that lead to higher interest rates because that just creates a different pressure. Joining me now, Victoria Clark, uh, UK Chief Economist at Santander. Thanks so much for joining me, Victoria. So, I mean, the headline here is maybe it's a technicality, but recession is avoided. It, it is. Recession's avoided, perhaps for now, perhaps not. And the, you know, the picture is that things look a bit better than we might have feared they would be six months ago. So we've avoided having a second consecutive quarter of, of GDP falling. So we've avoided that technical factor. But, you know, GDP basically hasn't grown. The economy hasn't grown in size through, through the whole of the year. I mean, if you look at the level of GDP, it's exactly the same at the end of December as where it was December before. Well, not just versus a year before, but if uh, if you compare across the G20 to pre-pandemic levels in absolute terms as opposed to percentage growth, we are still below pre-pandemic levels. Exactly. And the UK is the relative underperformer there. So we're smaller than our pre-pandemic size. And that is the work of inflation. But of course, you know, there has been inflation globally and, and there is you know clearly a story of the UK economy suffering a little bit more than elsewhere through, you know, through 2022. Uh, so clearly today we got the full quarter's growth numbers uh, in the books, uh, December the latest addition to that. Within the quarter, the quarter was saved by the first couple of months. December was quite a depressing uh, outlook. That's right. So October and November were OK. November was helped because 
of the World Cup and that boosted lots of spending in, in, in pubs and bars. And then we got into December and the economy shrunk and it shrunk by about, <coughs> excuse me, about half a percent in, in GDP. And that was because of a big drop in services output. Um, and that came as the health service in particular was impacted by strikes because of snow as well, which perhaps meant that there wasn't as much attendance in education. And it was these sorts of one-off factors that probably mean that December's not quite as bad as those headlines suggest. So just expand for me a, a bit on that, that point and, and how tangible is it that strikes are a big factor in that poor print of uh, December's? I think that they they are a factor. You can see that in the you know in the drop in, in health activity and the drop in appointments for doctors and, and nurses, which you can see in the numbers. Um, but beneath the surface, still, I mean, it, it's quite likely that if you took that out, GDP was probably a bit lower in December than it was. And I think you know this comes back to what's the you know what's the bigger picture when you take out all of these odd factors, the World Cup delays in premiership football matches, all these things which are quirks of the numbers. And it's that, you know, we're not growing, the growth is not there. That's largely because of inflation, because, you know, if you look at what we call, economists call consumer facing services, things that people might be more careful about going out and buying and things they do face to face, they're much, much weaker than they were before the pandemic. And inflation is driving, you know, huge busts down the middle of what you could buy in, in the amount of, of spending that you would do. And what you get in terms of how much you can actually take home at the high street. Um, uh, the Governor of the Bank of England earlier this week at least came out with some less pessimistic uh, uh, rhetoric on inflation about it coming down in, in the year ahead. Uh, to, to what extent has uh, most of the pain been taken when it comes to tightening monetary policy? Perhaps most of the pain when it comes to strikes uh, as well. I, I asked whether or not from here things might just start to improve for the government from a low base? So I think that the, the challenge for this coming year is monetary policy because we've had a hell of a lot of rate rises through the last year and most of that impact is still to be felt on people that are coming to refinance their mortgages at you know rates that will be much higher. They may have refinanced them at 2%. They might be looking now to refinance at, say, 4%. So there is a big squeeze on household spending for those households that come to face that. And that's, you know, that's the big question looking to this year, probably more inflation for six months, so a continued stagnation from that. And then you add the impact of interest rate rises. And I think this is what the Bank of England's becoming quite worried about, is that it, you know, it has a sense of how, how that might slow the economy. It's quite difficult to be precise about that. And they are worried about overcooking the extent of the rate rises. And just, just finally, uh, as we said, recession avoided. Perhaps that was better than we, we would have thought three to six months ago. H how did Q4 in December compare to, say, the US and continental Europe? So I think the UK has performed relatively poorly. Again, same picture versus its peers. I mean, part of that um, was the weather, um, part of it's, it's the strikes. But I think, you know, in, you know, in the US, in, in, in the Eurozone, actually, it looks as if things may have been a bit better. I think they were slightly better than better than they were in the UK. So we do seem to be consistently at this point coming out of the bottom of that pack. Victoria Clark, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Uh, some other stories uh, making the news this morning now. The boss of AstraZeneca, the second largest company uh, in the FTSE 100, has said uh, they chose to build a new manufacturing plant in Ireland because of what he called discouraging tax rates in the UK. Uh, Chief Executive uh, Sir Pascal Soirot uh, said ministers uh, were making what he called glib claims about Britain becoming a science superpower. The new research facility was part of a $360 million investment by the drugs manufacturer. Ofcom has launched a review of uh, mid-contract phone and broadband price rises. The regulator says a third of customers don't know their provider can increase the cost of their bills during their deal. It says it's concerned about the degree of uncertainty people are facing over inflation-linked price rises. There's a big boost for the UK high street this morning as uh, a new flagship store from a major global retailer opens. Swiss firm On has uh, unlocked the doors of its central London shop just months after a multi-million dollar flotation on the New York Stock Exchange, which valued the company at nearly uh, $750 million. In fact, I think they raised uh, $750 million. Uh, we can speak uh, with uh, Bianca Pestalozzi, uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa general manager uh, for On Running, who is uh, in 
the new store in uh, Regent Street uh, uh, this morning. Well, congrats on the, the store opening. It looks like it's already pretty busy behind you. Thanks a lot. Yes, we're very excited about the opening of the store. We opened a couple of minutes ago and it's already bustling with uh, with people who are coming in to shop with us. So we're very excited about Regent Street. And, and just uh, for those of us that, that, that or those that don't know, um, exactly what what what, uh, what is the brand? It's clearly running equipment and it, it started as direct to consumer. Is, is that is that fair to say or at least with an online focus? But but you're obviously opening a flagship uh, uh, physical store today. So we're a performance running brand from Switzerland. We've always had a strong e-com business, as, as you've mentioned, but we have a multi-channel distribution. So we work with wholesale partners and we also have our own retail stores, just like the one in, in Regent Street that I'm currently in, a select few around the world. And the London flagship store is our first flagship location in Europe outside of our home in Zurich. Yeah. And, and I guess it's not just a, a store this, it's, it's uh, as you kind of alluded to, you, you've got workout rooms as well. It's a place for, you, for your customers to actually spend quite a lot of time. Exactly. We believe that customers in the current retail landscape, they shop online for convenience, but they come to stores for more of an immersive experience with the brand. So at On London, shoppers can touch, feel, experiment with the product, with our sustainability project, such as uh, the Cyclone program. They can find the broadest range of on product across footwear and apparel that they'll find anywhere in London. And it's also a hub for us to interact with our community, to host runs and to, to interact with runners, to have our athletes and coaches here, to take our fans for runs. So all of this is what you'll find at the, at the Regent Street store. And uh, we look forward to, to welcoming many of you to the store. And, and to just talk, talk me through when the decision was made to open such a, a prime location store uh, in, in London. Uh, I mean, many people, of course, uh, noted how much rents fell during the pandemic. They've recovered a bit. But, but is it still only possible because they're lower than, say, they would have been five years ago? Or, or, or was this just on the cards no matter what? No, it's true that we, we started investing into our own retail stores during the pandemic. But for us, it was really a focus on delivering a, a, a very um, interactive experience to our to our customers. London is an important city for us in Europe. It's our number one city when it comes to D2C customers in the region. So the decision to make London a focus, to really build a hub for our community on, on Regent Street, that was the important one when we started looking for, for store locations uh, in London. And the UK as a market has been one of our fast growing markets and, and therefore remains a priority for the brand. And this is why we're really excited about the store opening today. And, and just finally, Bianca, sum up the brand for us. Is it is it really for elite high performance runners only? So we'll be a brand for, for high performance runners. Um, we have products like our Cloud Boom Echo um, that marathon runners, triathletes are, are winning races in. But of course, we are also speaking to everybody out there who's moving and who's active, whether this is in running or in different forms of workouts. And the Londoners in particular, they're, they're very active, they're avid runners, but they also just live a very active life. Um, so, so this is why we're excited to, to meet as many people as possible uh, in London, in our Regent Street store and across the other stores that we have in the city. Bianca, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, congrats on the store opening this morning. Thank you. Now, after a huge boom, figures out today suggest the current global economic difficulties are now hitting the UK used car market. The number of sales uh, last year fell by 8.5%. The rising number of deals on electric vehicles uh, was the only source uh, of optimism within the numbers. Uh, joining me now, Auto Traders Commercial Director uh, Ian Plummer. Uh, Ian, thanks so much for, for joining me. I, I guess just before we dive into the details, give us some context of the years or year before last year, because the 8.5% decline comes uh, after a decent couple of years for, for, for used car sales. Well, I think that context is absolutely vital because what you're seeing today is the result of in used cars what we did or didn't build as a used as a new car. So we've had three years of new car sales that have been roughly 1.6 million or so, but that compares to a, a long-term average of around 2.4 and peaks of 2.6, even 2.7 million. 
And quite simply, we are today in a supply constrained new, but also used car uh, market. Demand levels are very strong. Uh, so without enough cars coming into the new car market, they're not flowing through into the used car arena either, but there is strong demand. Pricing has been surging upwards very strongly and more than 40% price increase today compared to pre-pandemic times on like-to-like -like cars. So you've got a, a context which is very much supply constrained and actually quite healthy, despite what you, you touched on in terms of your introduction. We think the market is in a, in a good shape. And, and just, just to expand on that briefly, so the, the new cars were particularly supply constrained. Has that yes. eased a bit and therefore taken back some of the demand from used cars? Well, the new car situation is, is is linked back historically, obviously, to the fact that factories were closed during COVID eras. Um, the lockdown period affected manufacturing quite significantly. Uh, parts orders were cancelled for key components such as semiconductors. You then got into a, a price war with uh, sourcing of those semiconductors where manufacturers were competing against uh, people selling tablets and laptops to those of us in lockdowns and children needing additional IT equipment. They didn't get those semiconductors and they still don't have enough, sorry, enough of those microchips right now today to uh, fit them into their cars. Today's car needs around 1,500 uh, semiconductors. So you've got a, an awful lot of, of kit in, 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 in a typical car, double that for a, a high value uh, electric vehicle. And quite simply, that's constrained production. You added to that in uh, the last year or so, the, the, uh, the issues relating to Ukraine, also for the COVID lockdowns in China. That's what's led to lack of new car production. But quite simply, if you don't build a new car, it doesn't become a used car. It doesn't enable somebody to bring back a, a car as a part exchange when they're buying another one, whether it be new or used, and you slow down the whole market. So the pricing I dynamic is one of the key things that's changed there. But the used car arena of naught to five-year-old cars is back around 27% in terms of available stock and what it was um, pre-pandemic times. So, so um, touch on the, the trend underneath, uh, in particular EV sales. Obviously, we know demand has spiked for, for new EVs. Uh, what's it like in the, in the used uh, car market? Well, uh, EVs are a bright spot, as you touched on. There is strong demand for electric vehicles. Um, it's been growing strongly through the last uh, year or two. It's been boosted by announcements such as, you know, the political announcement to cut the sale of, uh, of petrol and diesel vehicles. That saw a huge surge of interest on those, uh, on those cars on our platform. Um, that continued through uh, difficulties to actually get petrol at pumps. That was October or so of 21, then price increases of petrol and so on. The energy price increase just more laterally has dampened a little bit of the demand boost that we've been seeing. At the same time, a supply of electric vehicles just comes surging through of used vehicles. They've, they've come off fleets and uh, they, they're coming back as part exchanges now, which is great to see. That is now leading, though, to a, 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 it'd be like a crossing of the lines between the supply curve and the demand curve. So pricing electric is coming down. In many ways, that's a good thing uh, because the affordability issue of electric is quite certainly a blocker for demand. But it's a challenge for the industry. But fundamentally, I think what we're seeing more broadly in the market is, is really strong demand for, for automotive. So we're seeing, for example, in the month of January, uh, visits to Autotrader were up, uh, up hugely, uh, up to a record level of 80 million uh, visits to the platform, around more than 10 million unique uh, visitors to the site. So that's up around 14% on January 2022. So belying this idea that there's no sort of health in the market, it's a supply constrained market, not a demand reduced one. And that's flowing through, we think, into sales. So our indicative sales data for January for used cars actually shows a growth of around 8%. Again, very different to the trend we saw we've highlighted through the whole of 2022 and signs that there's definitely an upturn um, coming through and dependent again on the supply of the available vehicles. And Ian, just, just finally, um, I know this is a big factor for, for the auto market in, in the US. Uh, is it less so here? The fact that the interest rates have risen, what sort of percentage of people buy their cars on a finance deal versus uh, buy them outright? Um, a growing number, to be to be honest with you. So we assume that with pricing having gone up as much as it has, that that's going to put a lot of people off. And it clearly will put off some people that makes cars uh, more challenging to get into, particularly if you're a first-time buyer. If you've got a car, you're bringing back a part exchange, which itself is of higher value, and you put that value down against the purchase price of the new vehicle, whether it be a new or used car. So you, you actually reduce the, the remaining amount that you've got to finance in some way. And actually, finance sales have grown quite strongly in the last year and more, as more people have seen finance as a good tool to be able to afford these maybe more, more uh, highly costed vehicles. 
So the finance rate has grown to around one in two used car buyers buying finance from the point of sale, the, the, the car reseller that they're working with. So it's seen as actually a great tool to enable more people to get into a car. Ian, thanks so much for joining me. Much appreciated. Thank you. So to come here on Ian King Live, we'll take a look at how uh, global markets are performing so far this morning. Welcome back. Let's have a look at how the markets are doing. Firstly, uh, in Asia, a soft end of the week, particularly for Hong Kong, down uh, a couple of uh, percent. It's been uh, a negative week overall for Hong Kong and China after what was a ferocious uh, rally over the back end of last year and the early part of this year uh, due to China's reopening, just giving up a bit of uh, those gains of late. The big story uh, in and around the Bank of Japan, uh, which we'll come to in, in just a moment on the currency front, but the Nikkei, as you can see, up uh, a fraction, about a third of a percent today. A soft uh, end of the week appears to be on the cards uh, for Europe, as well as you can see across the board declines for continental Europe. Uh, Germany in particular uh, down uh, a percent, uh, in part because of a 10 percent decline for Adidas, who uh, issued a profit warning last night, uh, particularly related to some of their celebrity endorsements, uh, one of which very controversial, the Yeezy uh, brand, uh, of course, tied to Kanye, the other less controversial, but it's not doing very well, uh, some other celebrity endorsement uh, packages that they have. Uh, closer to home in the UK, uh, the FTSE 100 is uh, down uh, about 0.4%. Of course, it's been trading near all-time highs of late uh, and just uh, giving up a little bit of ground today. Uh, of note, their standard charted down 5%, uh, albeit still up about 5% on the week as a whole. Uh, it's been uh, uh, some takeover talk uh, dominating uh, the share price moves for standard charted over the last week and uh, some of the hot air coming out today, but still up on the week as a whole. Uh, turning to currencies, uh, as I said, the focus uh, on uh, who might lead the Bank of Japan uh, next. Uh, Kuroda due to step down in April and uh, Kazuo Ueda uh, expected now to be named as uh, the new head of the Bank of uh, Japan. Initially, uh, we did see the yen jump. Uh, it's now uh, down about a percent. Uh, a lot of uncertainty is exactly what he'll stand for. It's a, a little bit of an unknown uh, choice, but you can see sterling itself not doing too much today, 121 against the dollar. Uh, and a quick look at oil prices up a couple of percent. Uh, Brent, though, remaining range bound in the mid 80s, 86, uh, well below where it was at the highs of last year. Uh, let's discuss uh, all of this uh, now with uh, the Chief Investment Officer uh, at Waverton Investment Management, uh, Bill Dinning. Bill, very good morning to you. Thanks so much for joining me. Morning. Um, let's touch first of all just uh, on the UK. FTSE 100, as we know, has been trading near, near record highs. We got the GDP data out this morning. Is that a big swing factor for the FTSE 100 or, or not really? I don't think so, really, because the FTSE 100 is really more about uh, sort of the global uh, situation in terms of, of demand. You know, it's the big multinationals, about two thirds of FTSE 100 earnings come from overseas. Uh, on the margin, though, the slightly better uh, data in the UK is probably good for the FTSE 250, which had a terrible year last year. Uh, and I do think the UK has got some support as a market, just partly because sentiment remains extremely gloomy about the UK. So I, I think the UK, it, it outperformed last year and it might have another good year. What one factor, of course, that people uh, look at for, for markets as a whole, including here, is what the sort of dividend yield of the index is like compared to where interest rates uh, are. And is there some encouraging signs that the Bank of England while perhaps won't be cutting rates anytime soon, might not have too many rate hikes left in it. Well, I think that's right. And in fact, I think one of the things that's been interesting about the market in, in the last few months has been the market has been thinking that the Federal Reserve is also quite close to the end of its tightening cycle. And the market's been very confident that in the United States, the Fed would be cutting interest rates in the second half of the year. Uh, here in the UK, uh, for a long time, the market was expecting the Bank of England to get rates up to about 4.5% and then stay there. I think one of the things that's interesting at the moment is that actually that's shifted a little bit. So peak for the UK is more like four and a quarter, and uh, there is an expectation that the bank can probably cut rates in the second half of the year, whereas the confidence in how far the Fed can cut rates is, is, is waning a little bit. So I think on the margin, I think that's right. <clears throat> I think it probably is helpful for the UK. And if that has a knock-on to to sterling, i.e. if UK interest rates aren't going up as much and might start coming down, that might be not supportive for sterling. But then for the economy, that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
So, so let's touch on, on the US. It sounds like, therefore, you have a slightly more bearish view than perhaps where consensus is. And of course, it comes off uh, quite a strong rally for US markets in, in January. Yeah, I think our, our concern about the US is really, A, what we were just saying. I think the Fed is, is Fed's been making it very clear they expect to keep interest rates potentially at a, a higher level for longer. And I, I think we sort of kind of think that's probably quite realistic. Because the UK economy, the US economy at the moment is, is clearly quite robust. And domestic demand in the States does have an impact on U, US inflation. UK domestic demand's impact on UK inflation is less. So I think in the US there's concern about rates. And I think the other thing is the cycle is probably rolling over in the States. A lot of very reliable indicators of, uh, of recessions in the United States are flashing red warning signals. So we think that the US economy could be weaker in the months ahead, but rates may have to stay higher because of the inflation backdrop. So that makes us a little bit cautious. Let's touch on Asia and China in particular. Clearly had a ferocious rally at the back end of last year from low levels uh, on the back of, of course, the, the reopening post-COVID, uh, extended COVID lockdown story. Is that now priced in all the good news or, or not? Uh, probably not. I mean, obviously, as ever with, with China, it's a little bit difficult to sort of uh, really read the signs of exactly what's happening. But I think that the two angles I would, I would suggest that are probably got a long way to go yet is one certainly if the, if china does continue it's it's sort of reopening and people are going back to work then clearly industrial production will pick up it will be good for domestic incomes the other side of it is if, if the chinese uh, are traveling again that's a really good thing for a number of countries in the asia region it's particularly good for a country like thailand and more broadly it's quite good for sort of global tourism so it can have a positive impact on the global economy the only thing is if the US is particularly slowing, I mean, the US in particular slowing down, whether what China's doing could be enough to offset that, I'm not so sure. But yes, the China reopening, I think, has further to go. Bill, thanks so much for joining me. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Uh, still to come here on Ian King Life, uh, could college and university sports become the next battleground in uh, high value sports rights? We'll discuss. Welcome back. Uh, millions of people around the world will watch the Super Bowl this Sunday uh, on TV, tablets and smartphones. The rights for the NFL were recently sold for $110 billion and the sports rights market looks set to continue growing. Swedish firm Spideo wants uh, to expand from its traditional work on video replay analysis and into the sports rights market. And joining me now is the chief executive of Spideo, Patrick Olsen, uh, who was also an influ influential figure in the standardization of Bluetooth uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, Patrick, great to see you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. So, so just talk us through exa exactly what your, your company does. This is outside of the Super Bowl or the Premier League match this Sunday, it's for sports that's going on a couple of levels below that. Exactly. So basically what we do is we automate the process of capturing and producing sports on video. So essentially removing the need for a cameraman and removing the need for a big sports uh, production studio. Uh, still we produce content that is rich, uh, has audio commentary, overlays, sponsor graphics, scoreboards, etc. But without any human interaction. And, and so typically, if we're talking about lower league football here in, in, in the UK, it wouldn't be filmed or produced to, to a high level because the costs involved were too high. Exactly. You're able to do that at an exactly. affordable so level. Basically, what we do, we reduce the cost of production from thousands of dollars per game to just a few dollars per game. And that opens up an entirely new market that hasn't been available before. We can now enable millions of games to be available for online viewing. Uh, to viewers that weren't able to watch these games uh, in the past. And, and your partnerships then are with the individual teams themselves as opposed to the leagues? It, how does it, it, how does it work? It's mostly with rights holders. So there is a movement across the world now where the media rights for these mid-level sports is being acquired. And, uh, and that is because we have automatic production. So we can lower the cost of the production and then all of a sudden you can do pay-per-view, sponsors, ads and things like that to monetize those rights. So here in the UK, talk us through who some of your clients and, and, and partnerships are with. Uh, in the UK, we mostly have our video analysis customers like Premier League teams uh, and, and such. But a good example of this would be one of our customers in Minnesota that does 20,000 ice hockey high school games per season. And they do that with a team of five people. So every weekend, there are hundreds of games running, automatically produced, made available to the entire ice hockey community in, in Minnesota. 
and, and uh, Premier League uh, teams here in the UK, do you have any of them? And, and if their main TV rights, obviously, are already tied up with the Premier League itself and airs on our, our sister channel on Sky Sports, for example, what, what can you do with them if, if they've already given those rights away to, to Sky Sports yeah, or BT exactly. Sports or whoever? So for those teams like Brentford, Leicester City and such that use our system, they use our system for video analysis. So to automatically capture trainings and matches, get live footage, get live data so that they can analyze and do performance improvements during the game, after the game, and during the training and so on. Really interesting. And so if we step back from specifically what, what you do for some of these teams, what is your view on the state of the market at, at the moment? Essentially, sports rights have, uh, have just continued to, to rise no matter what the economic climate over, over the last two decades, broadly speaking. Do you think that will continue uh, with similar rates of inflation or uh, is it starting to plateau? No, it will definitely continue. The interesting thing is that sports tech is now transforming all parts of sports. Uh, everything from consumption to production to analysis to experiences, interactive, interactive experiences. This will increase the value of the rights that are out there on all levels. And, and how much is that inflation in the, the, the price uh, that, that broadcasters pay for the live sports tied to gambling and the way that that has, in general, despite some laws being passed in the UK, in general, continuing to see liberalization, particularly in the US. Yeah, definitely that's happening. And as you said, there has been changes in the US that will affect this as well. Um, and I think also the interactivity of how you want to uh, consume sports in the future. We will not be looking at sports from start to end anymore. We will be interacting with the game, we'll be tapping on players, get data, place live bets and things like that. It will change the way that we consume sports uh, in the future. And, and does your company uh, enable that even further? Exactly. I mean, basically, you can't do that unless you capture the entire pitch, create data from the game. That's the foundation for being, being able to create such interactive experiences. Patrick, uh, great speaking to you. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Now, it's been nearly 10 years since the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh, in which more than 1,000 people were killed. The disaster inspired the foundation of Know the Origin, a hub for sustainable products with traceable roots. The company was wound down in the wake of the COVID pandemic, but has just been brought back out of liquidation by Rachel Watkin. Uh, founder of the Tiny Box Company. And Rachel uh, joins us now from her main distribution uh, centres. Thanks so much for, for joining me uh, this morning. So just to remind everyone exactly what Know Your Origin is, is all about. Good morning. Uh, greetings from sunny Sussex. Uh, so Know the Origin is uh, like a department store online at the moment, uh, designed to provide sustainable and ethical products that have full traceability, so people know what they're buying. It's clothing, accessories, beauty products, houseware, uh, anything that uh, people would need for a house, uh, mini department store. We're not quite John Lewis size yet, but uh, hopefully in the future. <laughs> And, and uh, obviously, as, as we mentioned in the intro, you, you've brought this, this uh, company uh, and this initiative uh, out of liquidation. Is there a greater need for it than ever? Or is there at least some trend uh, in place, say, over the last decade where uh, we've started to be a bit better at, at not exploiting either the environment or, or workers in, in certain regards? I would love to say that it's getting better. But, uh, you know, the truth is that 10 years after the, the plaza disaster, we are still in a, a circle of fast fashion, disposable fashion, disposable products. So the, the idea of Know the Origin is to make it more accessible. You know, if people have a choice and we take the pain point out of the, of the, of the, um, of the buying process where they can have easy access at reasonable prices, then hopefully we can stimulate change. But we've still got a long way to go. And, and uh, is the UK itself uh, in a fairly good position on this type of front uh, or, or not versus uh, other sort of developed markets? Uh, I would say in lots of ways we're very behind because fast fashion is, is, is consumed at such a high rate in this country compared to some other countries. The UK and America, are you know, we consume it far faster than uh, the Scandinavia, Germany, where they have a little more, more responsibility, shall we say. Um, I wanted to get your take as well on, on uh, uh, your, your, your perspective as a, a very successful UK entrepreneur with the Tiny Box Company. We saw this morning... 
uh, a story that AstraZeneca has committed to a, a big new investment but in, in Ireland and said that the UK was not conducive to, to greater investment, particularly on the tax front here in the UK. Is that something you agree with or do you think it's a good place to, to, to do business and start companies? Oh, well, that's a tricky one. Um, I think part of it depends on what type of business you're, you're setting up here, uh, you know, as to what finance you have access to. Uh, I think certainly as a female entrepreneur, it's a lot more difficult in this country than some other countries uh, because of unconscious bias and everything else. You know, so it's less about the tax, but it's more about access to funding, shall we say. And then once you're more established, yes, the, the, the tax is quite high here. You know, if you add corporation tax, dividend tax, tax uh yeah it's um it's challenging and and do you think the last couple of years in particular the environment's got tougher uh well i was very surprised to hear on the news this morning that we're not technically in recession because yes the trading uh, every business that i speak to you know we do clinics um uh, we speak to a lot of other businesses a lot of people are struggling right now so yeah that was surprising news for me and if uh, I wanted to touch as well on uh, a personal aspect of your story, because it's discussing all of these these initiatives you're involved with, it's somewhat amazing to me that you've managed it all because you've had an enormous amount on your plate, I believe, and, and uh, recently, uh, I think, successfully battled uh, breast cancer. Talk, talk us through the uh, uh, how you managed to, to juggle this extraordinary amount on your plate. So first of all, a fantastic team. You know, I work with some brilliant people. Secondly, you know, we moan about the NHS. What a fantastic journey that I had. I was diagnosed in October with breast cancer. It was caught early. Uh, I have a genetic disorder, so they suggested straight away a double mastectomy. Diagnosed on the 20th of October, operation 16th of December, and uh, you know, I'm seven weeks down the line and doing great. And when I say double mastectomy, they they took everything, my lymph nodes, you know. Uh, and, you know, that is down to a fantastic NHS. Well, it's 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 great to just hear the, the success story, Rachel, on your personal health. But uh, when you tie it into to on the business side and then uh, more altruistic endeavours like Know the Origin, it's really an inspiring story. So congratulations and long may it continue. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ra Rachel uh, Watkin, the founder of uh, Tiny Box Company, and, and many other things, uh, as we heard just there. Uh, both the FT and uh, the Times, uh, uh, both uh, business pages include a story high on the list uh, on the fact that activist investor Nelson Peltz is giving up on a campaign that he had for a seat on the board of Disney. It comes, of course, uh, after Disney CEO Bob Iger laid out uh, his plans for the next few years uh, since returning to the helm uh, earlier in the week. And it included some cost-cutting and profit focus. So Peltz has dialed back his att attack on the, uh, the management of Disney. Interestingly, though, yesterday, uh, after the earnings call, which was on Wednesday evening when the stock initially jumped over 5 uh, percent through the regular session in the US. Yes, they gave up all of those gains, perhaps just showing uh, how nervous uh, market investors are at, at the moment. Initial good news evaporated by the end of the session yesterday. Uh, also worth checking out a story talking of the US and uh, earnings movers uh, in the FT, also on our sister station CNBC's website. Uh, Lyft, uh, their earnings were reported last night. Uh, Lyft, of course, is a U.S. pure play ride-sharing app, which basically operates as a, a duopoly in the U.S. with Uber. And their shares are down some 30 per cent uh, overnight. Uh, Uber had strong numbers uh, earlier in the week, which were largely welcomed by the market. Uh, Lyft uh, could hardly be more different. Worth checking those stories out. Joining me now, uh, as ever, uh, on a Friday, is the uh, financial markets commentator, and Evening Standard columnist uh, Neil Collins. Uh, Neil, very good morning to you. Thanks uh, so much for, for joining me. Uh, talk, talk me through uh, the, first, uh, the first story that's caught your attention today. Oh, I, I think that the, the most extraordinary one, it was the, um, the fine uh, levied by the EU um, to 2.3 billion. Um, and it looks to me as though they thoroughly deserve, we thoroughly deserved our kicking. Um, because we were letting all this Chinese goods in at prices which were clearly 
wrong. They were far too low, so they avoided duty. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty embarrassing for the government. Uh, and that was when we were in the EU, of course. Um, I dare say it'd be different this time. Um, but I suppose we need to talk about the um, GNP figures, even though they're pretty dull. I mean, the UK economy is sort of becalmed at the moment. Um, I think people don't really know what's going to happen. We are on the edge of a technical recession, but I don't suppose people could tell the difference between a technical recession and a real recession, although a real recession is probably worse. Um, I think that uh, uh, Neil, uh, I do think is is that clearly, as you say, that, that this technical recession just avoided uh, because the economy was flat as opposed to declining. Now would need two fresh quarters of declines to to trigger that uh, headline for the government or or whatever we'd be focusing on. And actually, the comps for the first half of next year aren't too bad. So the government might possibly escape ever having to face that headline? Uh, that may be the case, yes. But, I mean, <laughs> the amounts are so small, we're so close to zero, uh, that um, uh, some sort of obscure uh, outside influence, like, say, a fall in the oil price or a rise in the oil price, could make the difference between the, 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 the net position being plus or minus. So I think we're getting to the point where we're almost sort of uh, angels dancing on the head of a pin here. Um, you know, the economy is not in good shape. And I think that uh, much depends on what happens with the budget next month uh, to see whether that will produce the sort of increase in, in people's uh, confidence, I think, is what's needed, rather than uh, a sort of crowd-pleasing uh, technical budget which uh, cuts a few uh, cuts a few um, taxes, which which are. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about this. No, don't worry at all. And, and I totally agree. It's certainly true that only the UK and Russia of the G20 have economies that are still smaller in absolute terms than their, their pre pre-pandemic levels. One of the other questions I just wanted to, to, to get your, your view on is the sort of jitters, despite a strong rally in January, that we're seeing in, in the US market. I mentioned Lyft overnight, but perhaps most interesting was Google over the last two days has shed $150 billion in, in market cap, all because of the launch of the update to their search engine uh, underwhelmed a little bit. Yes. Um, I don't think anybody really understands how much impact these uh, second-generation uh, search engines are going to have. Um, I think that their capacity for giving uh, uh, wrong answers on the new tried and tested principle of garbage in, garbage out, um, has, <clears throat> they certainly haven't overcome that yet. I think it was a bit of a shock. To, uh, to discover that Google, which is a pretty well-run and impressive organization, mm -hmm. could have made such an elementary blunder with uh, some of the answers. I think it was the one about uh, uh, whether the uh, telescope had found the first uh, non-solar system planet. And it said, yes, it had. And that was the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it uh, undermined the the uh, credibility of lots of other answers, and I think the knock-on effect was was dramatic on the share price. Don't forget, these tech companies are still hugely highly valued, very sensitive to any sort of change in the market's view of future prospects. So uh, it's going to continue to be very volatile. Neil Collins, thanks so much for joining me this morning. Very much uh, appreciated, uh, as always. I sort of come here on Ian King Live uh, as the music industry prepares uh, to party at the Brit Awards. Uh, they're stepping up a fight against piracy. We'll be right back. It's the biggest week of the year for the British music industry. Uh, we started with the Grammys and tomorrow night the Brit Awards will highlight current and future UK talent. But behind this weekend's star performances, the industry is fighting the twin problems of piracy and theft. 
And one British company wants to lead the way in combating music crime. Uh, joining me now is Nick Stewart, Chief Executive of the anti-piracy business TCAT, also known as To Catch a Thief. Uh, Nick, thanks so much for, for, for joining me. So your company, uh, you have software that it tries to track music piracy. That's right, uh, Wilfred, we do. Um, TCAT has two main products. One is called Street Date, which makes certain that all the music that is put on the DSPs is actually up there. There are 229 uh, countries that have DSPs, and so we track to make sure that music that should be up there is there, and then we're able to fingerprint whether or not there's been any infringement or any piracy. Uh, we're a young company but we've had an enormous take up on the products that we offer and I think it's one of the most significant uh, pieces of technology since I've been involved in the music business. And, and clearly 10, 20 years ago uh, on streaming and on digital music, uh, piracy was a huge problem with, with companies like Napster. Most people assume because the labels themselves have shifted to embracing streaming that it's not much of a problem today. Gauge, gauge the reality for me. Well, piracy is a is a factor, Wilfred. I mean, you know, the office of um, the IPO have said that there's nine billion pounds worth of business lost each year through piracy and counterfeiting, and and it results in a huge number of of jobs being lost. I mean, every day, every day, a uh, hundred thousand tracks globally get put up on the DSPs. That's the digital streaming platforms. That's Apple, Amazon, Deezer. Uh, Spotify and the rest of it, and we track where for our clients where that music is and whether it's up there legally, and and the rights holders are being paid correctly. Um, just finally, um, apologies that we're, we're a little bit out of time, but uh, more broadly, uh, we've seen an extraordinary inflation value in, in terms of music rights and a lot of artists selling their back catalogues. Do you feel that that might have peaked now, or in fact, if you tighten up on piracy, perhaps it's got another leg higher to go? It could do. There have been some very, obviously, hypnosis leading the way, primary wave as well. Um, there have been some very big uh, catalogue sales and there's enormous value and therefore it's up to the owners now of the uh, of these catalogues to make sure that their music is protected and they get paid correctly. Um, and we've only just begun, but we're making significant progress. Next year, thanks so much for joining me this morning. Very much appreciated. Chief Executive uh, of... T cat. Uh, we've got about uh, 30 seconds or so left in the show. Just wanted to touch back on the markets, uh, which uh, have taken a little bit of a turn uh, south over the course of the show. The stocks 600 uh, index in Europe is now down a little more than uh, 1%, uh, whilst US futures have also worsened uh, during the course uh, of the morning. The Nasdaq, the tech heavy index in the US, is expected to open lower by almost 1% uh, as things stand. The S&P expected to open lower by about 0.4%. Uh, meanwhile, here in the UK, the FTSE 100 down about 0.4%, pulling back, of course, from recent uh, uh, all-time highs. That does it for Ian King Live today. Thanks so much for watching.